Let's uh, start off with Jürgen Habermas. What I'm going to do today uh, of Habermas, uh, I'll do it as an extension of the concept of hermeneutics and uh, um, but there is also a political ideology class that I have to take on his um, um, life world the concept of the life world he evolved uh, much later and um, there is a horrible word there that precedes in I don't know if you've seen your uh, uh, syllabus there is a word that precedes uh, a life world it's called holism it's an entirely, entirely nonsensical term. Okay, what is holism? You have holism, partism, and I don't know, I don't think you do. I, you don't have those kind of things. Uh, so, but we'll deal with that when we come to that. Today, just uh, let me pick up uh, Habermas's uh, connection with hermeneutics. In fact, even in understanding the life world, one should have an understanding of his hermeneutics. Because for him, it is through uh, this, the concepts that he uses uh, for what he calls contemporary speech situations. Uh, those are the basis of the life world. Now, if we are talking about the applicability of uh, Habermas's ideas in the context of Um, before I launch into this, I must make one point very, very clear. Habermas began as a member of the Frankfurt School, 
the Frankfurt School was nothing but the University of Frankfurt. And uh, the Frankfurt School actually took its inspiration from Georgi Lukács. Okay. Okay, uh, who is considered to be Georgi Lukács did this uh, around the 1920s and uh, he is called a critical theorist. I'll do a look. His, the name is pronounced Georgi. It is L-U-K-C-S. So technically, uh, the way you pronounce that name is Lukacs. So it has to be Lukacs. That's the German, uh, sorry, Hungarian pronunciation. Lukács, but people just say Lukács, though technically it's Lukács, the ch sound has to come briefly after the ch sound, C is pronounced ch and S is pronounced sh, but when you conjugate them together, the sound of the S is shortened, you know, like that. Lukács. So, uh, Georgi Lukács uh, is considered to be the uh, progenitor or the pioneer of the critical theory tradition of Marxism. Okay, and... Uh, I have told you that I'm basically trying to, at some point, I'm working on too many things right now. But once I get these out of my way, uh, I want to write a book uh, which uh, a part of it is already written actually. Uh, uh, I want to write this book in which I want to claim that there isn't very much to distinguish uh, between uh, Marxism and liberalism. And if you can accept 
uh, redistribution, the concept of redistribution in John Rawls, and still call him a liberal, why can't you call Marx also a part of the larger liberal tradition, uh, despite the fact that he only partially eschews uh, using the individualist notion. Uh, Marx's uh, idea of good is not a common good like a moral common good, which you find in people like uh, uh, Rousseau and also Immanuel Kant. Uh, Marx uses a notion of uh, social good, if at all. He doesn't actually talk about good. But if you want to really interpret him that way, then he probably just talks about some kind of social good. So, uh, so I believe that uh, he is somebody who's very much, because he's not for the giving up of science, he's not for the giving up of technology, he's not for any of those things. He just wants to change the mode of production from the capitalist mode of production to the, uh, what he calls the communist mode of production. Now, the revolution that he wanted to happen did not happen. He tried himself. He didn't write a theory and said, now go, uh, get this revolution done with. He didn't do that. Uh, he was somebody who formed the Communist International, which is in short, the common turn. Uh, and he tried to bring about uh, workers of different countries in uh, Europe, which had seen capitalism, and uh, also in America, he basically tried to organize workers into uh, a transnational community. Uh, when you say a transnational community, what we mean is that uh, he wasn't recognizing nation state boundaries. For him, nation state boundaries were the result of the exigencies of capitalism. And if you want to overcome capitalism, then you also have to overlook all the exigencies uh, of capitalism that created uh, various different kinds of, uh, what should we say, boundaries. So he was not in favor of a nation state. So he tried to create a, uh, create a uh, transnational uh, uh, unity among workers, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, but however, all his attempts failed. And a uh, number of other forms uh, came up, which is similar to his, but not exactly like his. Uh, one is the uh, um, uh, anarchism. Anarchism, again, anarchism of the uh, Bakunin variety, anarchism of the Proudhon variety, which I told you the other day, 
is uh, usufruct uh, anarchism and uh, anarchism uh, of uh, the Peter Kropotkin uh, variety. And then there were these others like George's uh, Sorrel and uh, uh, Syndicalism, uh, which was the organization of working class into syndicates to fight for their rights. And there was a Bernstein in the middle of this all, uh, who has been classified as a revisionary. So Marxism for some has been the holy grail, something that you cannot touch and make changes to. Uh, but despite all those attempts, uh, you see that both anarchism and Marxism, uh, which had the revolution, uh, they differed over what will happen uh, after the revolution, but they agreed on the revolution against the capitalist system. They had no difference of opinion there. But despite all that, you will find that there is no revolution. Many attempts were made and uh, despite those attempts to create working class unity, workers continued to stick to their primordial loyalties. Okay, uh, workers identified with people who were um, yeah. workers identified with uh, people who were, what should I say, um, of their own language or of their own church community so that transnational anti-capitalist working class consolidation just did not happen. So it is in that context that Georgi Lukács basically tried to understand what was wrong with Marxism. He was the first person to believe that there was something seriously wrong in the theoretical con construction of uh, Marxism. So you find that uh, uh, Lukács actually divides Marx's life into two periods, one which he calls the early Marx and the early Marx is the one who wrote uh, those different, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, those uh, different articles in uh, the Algemeine Al Jahrbucher, which was in Journal of Sorts. Some people say it was also called the Deutsche Allgemein Jahrbuch, uh, 
I'm, I did some searching. Uh, people added the Deutsche uh, to let people, let the world know that this is German. But otherwise, it was simply the uh, Algemein Jahrbucher, which is uh, to be understood as uh, the general journal or newspaper for everyone. So that is the Algemein part. Jahrbucher is the uh, now people tell me that it is Yarbusher. Uh, I don't know. Probably it is Yarbusher. But in, in the articles in that, uh, he wrote content, or I should say content, which had a great deal of uh, what can be called philosophical. And uh, these writings were followed by his first books, the EPMs of uh, 1844, which is uh, the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. And if you read this work, this is considered to be his first publication. And uh, if you read this particular work, uh, you find that there is quite a bit of philosophy in it. Okay, there's quite a bit of philosophy in it. And if you read even the Communist Manifesto of uh, 1848, um, in that too, there is uh, quite a bit of philosophical thinking, uh, which slowly started changing from 1856 onwards uh, in when he wrote this book, The Poverty of Philosophy. When he wrote this book, The Poverty of Philosophy, uh, that is when he started abandoning philosophical ideas, philosophical analysis, and went more and more in the direction of economics. And not only did he go more and more in the direction of economics, he also went quite deep into what he himself called scientific understanding of economics and economic processes. Now, this part of uh, uh, Marx is what Lukács uh, basically calls the part which is, um, what should I say, uh, the later marks. And he says that the later marks emphasized more and more on economics and he totally abandoned philosophy. And there is a, an economic determinism in the later Marx, which is not there in the early Marx. And he attributes the failure uh, to take off of the revolution of the working class to this, uh, what Lukács uh, basically says, uh, is the unnecessary emphasis on science and economics. So he was there, he was critically analyzing Marx, 
so the critical theory tradition people say belong uh, started with lukacs okay uh, where you are trying to criticize marx from within you're using the same categories that marx used and you're saying that is the reason why it didn't work okay uh, say as opposed to somebody like eric from who says that you know you should have less of economics and he supplies us with psychoanalysis post freudian psychoanalysis and puts it where marx had originally put uh, economics so that is another kind of criticism so eric from uh will though some people say he can be included in the critical theory tradition i would very strongly argue against it because he brings out and uh, not that it's invalid but uh it is a criticism from outside okay and by adding things from outside so that is something that we need to understand okay so this is the critical theory tradition and uh, the next big person who was a part of the critical theory tradition is theodore adorno the there is no e at the end of theodore here um theodore adorno and uh, adorno talks about two kinds of dialectics positive dialectics and negative dialectics and he says that the dialectics that marx is talking about are lopsided because he's only emphasizing on the positive side of the dialectic but along with the positive comes the negative and marx simply doesn't even realize the existence of negative dialectics now that is one criticism that you will find coming and i'm going to do this when we do marxism okay not now uh, so these are again from within okay but uh, probably the most valid and uh, most valid and good critique came from habermas do you remember i had talked to you about the base superstructure model of marx does anyone remember this yes sir yeah now marx had said that uh, the base is economic and that the uh, superstructure is legal political he posited a deterministic
relationship between the base and I'll just write it as SS superstructure. He said, primarily changes take place in the economic base and later they get reflected in the legal political superstructure. And that is how the movement from one mode of production to another mode of production happens. So you move from the primitive mode of production to the feudal mode of production and from there to the capitalist mode of production because of changes first taking place in the economic base and that leading to uh, uh, changes in the superstructure which is legal and political. And therefore, this part of it has been called uh, economic determinism. That is exactly what uh, Georgi Lukács also would say, uh, does say. And uh, this particular point, some people uh, dispute it. Some people dispute it and say, no, you can look at it in uh, another way. And all that is uh, basically mental gymnastics. And we'll talk about those mental gymnastics. How much of mind bending can you do to justify something which is unjustifiable is a question that I leave for uh, the lessons on Marx. But uh, for now, uh, the base superstructure model of Marx, uh, along with another model that I talked to you about, hopefully you remember that as well. Uh, the model is uh, about the mode of production itself. And uh, the mode of production as comprising of two things forces of production and relations of production. I hope you remember this. Yes, sir. Yeah. I told you again, there is a deterministic relationship here. Marx emphasizes on the forces of production and says it is the nature of the forces of production that actually determines the nature of relationships of production. So when he talks about what he calls uh, the primitive mode of production, he says that in the production process as such, in the production process, there isn't uh, a hierarchy. It is relatively egalitarian. And as a result of that, even the relations of production, which we would call society, but he doesn't call them that, he says that is also egalitarian. Okay, so egalitarian or relatively egalitarian forces of production produce uh, 
relations of productions which are related uh, egalitarian okay now when you come to the feudal mode of production where you have a hierarchy that hierarchy which is actually in the forces of production also finds its way into the relations of production that's what marx claims and then he even claims that uh, apart from the forces of production uh, uh, in feudalism even in capitalism because the means of production are owned by the capitalist class and the working class is dependent on the class uh, capitalist class for its uh, work uh, therefore they basically uh, have to play an inferior role even in the forces of production uh, sorry in the relations of production uh, in the capitalist system so this is that deterministic kind of relationship now habermas has a problem and his point of departure from marxism or marxist construct of the mode of production uh and the base superstructure relationship uh is what created a comprehensive critique so habermas's thought began here this is where habermas's thought started taking shape and finally went on beyond marxism into the life world okay but let us try and understand what are the objections that habermas has to marxist these two models first let's go to the base superstructure model i'm just going to call it uh, ss superstructure now i told you there is a determinism the base changes and then the superstructure changes accordingly okay uh the base changes and then the superstructure changes accordingly so if you are looking at this kind of a thing then what are you looking at a deterministic relationship the changes in the base determine the changes in the superstructure but habermas habermas argues that this is a completely completely wrong model he says it is not at all sustainable and habermas had seen what we have so called been calling
neoliberalism i personally would like to call it uh a revival of classical if you remember what we discussed this morning it will be obvious to you that the revival of classical learning sorry not learning liberalism and neoliberalism didn't happen at the level of the economic base it happened at the level of the political superstructure the political superstructure took decisions especially especially in the case of margaret thatcher and uh, ronald reagan who initiated economic changes in the economies of their respective countries okay so the whole idea of the state itself encouraging free market economic economy uh and by free market i asked you to remember uh not to not to forget the fact that uh, there is uh what should i say uh this isn't the free market of the adam smith variety but this is a free market in the sense that it is minimally regulated okay but where is the change coming from the change is coming from the top it's coming from the superstructure okay the whole of europe saw a big change it saw a huge change in economics because of the changes initiated in it by the superstructure okay so the base didn't start the change the change in the base was initiated by the superstructure so the superstructure determined what the nature of the base would be for habermas the language is habermas not milton friedman or james buchanan not any of those people okay we are not talking about them we are talking about habermas habermas was very much around when this all all these things were happening he's still around anyway uh so you see he therefore says that the space superstructure relation that has been constructed in marx is not a tenable or a viable uh kind of a relationship in fact he says in there is no such thing where you can have the separation of an economic base from a legal political superstructure so that whole scientific argument that i am making which the other people couldn't make that particular claim of marx was completely trashed completely trashed by habermas habermas said that 
there is no economic base there is no political superstructure one is not determining another at different times different kinds of processes are on maybe at some time in history economics took precedence but now is the time when politics is taking precedence in order to usher economic change politics is ushering in economic change that is the argument he makes and if you look at it in the case of india which i will do tomorrow morning uh if you look at what happened in the 1990s if you look at the period of uh prime minister pv narasimha rao and uh, our finance minister dr manmohan singh where did the changes come the changes came from the political superstructure they came from there and where were the changes initiated they were initiated in economics you abolished the license raj you threw open the economy you wanted several people to come and invest here in the country so all that happened and as time progressed and i'll talk about that you have fii's foreign institutional investors and fdi's foreign direct investors okay all those things are changes initiated by the superstructure by politics not by economics and also please remember that when i spoke to you about the drug economy okay and the bootleg liquor economy and the music economy all three coalescing together uh to produce free enterprise and free entrepreneurial uh spirit among people activities were which were hitherto considered criminal were simply not looked at any more it's like what our kcr and uh, narendra modi are doing falsifying figures they are falsifying figures of covid patients of covid deaths and i still can't understand what is the purpose of this stupid lockdown till 2 o'clock i don't know the roads are jam packed okay people are going to markets and they are you know there's no physical distancing people are falling on top of each other so you mean to say that this particular virus the b1617 as it's called works only between 2 and 9 in the night uh the i mean sorry between 2 and 6 in the morning in and it then goes to sleep when the virus goes to sleep we go out and do what we have to do is that it you said you are closing things down you are closing things down because you don't want people to gather together you don't want mass gatherings on the one hand you have a lockdown 
on the other hand you're saying 40 people are allowed in a wedding and you're saying 20 people are allowed in a funeral as per the who guidelines in funerals especially if they are covid funerals you sh there should be only one member and that too that member should be watching the proceedings from at least 50 meters away that is the guideline only one member and the face of the dead person is to be shown in the hospital only to five people. Where have all those gone? When we didn't have these many deaths, those rules were there. Now that the deaths are going up merrily, where did the, all these rules go? So what are you doing? You are in effect saying, take care of yourself. We are not going to take care of you. Okay, so this is laissez faire. We sing laissez faire now. Take care of yourself. I don't care if you don't have a smartphone. I don't care if you can't book an appointment. You are old. Go take somebody's help. That's the guideline. Go take somebody's help. Whose help will you take? People who can't use smartphones, can't afford smartphones, whose help will they take? Okay. So, you have to understand that the political is pretty important. And all the economic reforms under Narasimha Rao and Manmohan Singh and even later on, all these reforms were initiated by politics and the superstructure. So, the legal political superstructure model doesn't stand. It is effectively proven that uh, the base superstructure kind of thing that Marx posited is not something that works at all. It just doesn't work. Now let's come to forces of production and the relations of production. Okay. I'll call them FOP and ROP. forces of production determining relations of production okay this is one part that Habermas again has a problem with. What Habermas is saying, basically, is that you don't have to collapse forces of production and relations of production into one particular category. Into one particular category called the mode of production. He says, you can't and don't need to do that. And more importantly, you cannot even make a build a deterministic relationship between forces of production and relations of productions. production. He says that is not a sustainable kind of a thing. Okay, so what is his objection to this? 
he says mocks He says that is the problem with Marx. He recognizes only one kind of rationality. And that is because of his thinking like the positivists. So he called Marx I'm not going to explain scientism to you now. That will take some time. But for the moment, simply take it as scientism is an offshoot of this whole belief that science can solve everything. Okay? So... The issue that is picked up by uh, Habermas is that scientism pervades Marxist thinking. And that is the reason why, even after the revolution, he doesn't want to let go of the science and the scientific knowledge. And he doesn't want to let go of industries. All that he's saying is, don't let them be in private ownership. They should be common ownership. But the means of production are not to be destroyed. The means of production are the industries. Scientific knowledge is valid. Everything else is valid. Okay. So, he says, so where is the revolution here? Where is the revolutionary thinking here? There is no revolutionary thinking here. And this collapsing of forces of production and uh, relations of production into one category is this failure to understand that there can be different kinds of rationality. Please remember what I talked to you about as relative rationality. Well, but don't take, don't conflate the Peter Winch kind of meaning of uh, relative rationality or the Diltian uh, idea of rationality being relative to something, relative to a time period, don't conflate that. But what 
you should look at, and this is where the hermeneutics in Habermas begin. Okay, this is where the hermeneutics in Habermas begin. And what are the hermeneutics that he's talking about? The hermeneutics that he's talking about are indirect as yet. They are indirect as yet, but they begin with this statement that Okay. Most translations will tell you it's instrumental reason. <clears throat> Some translations use technocratic rationality because remember, he is another of these wonderful Germans. And I don't say it in a demeaning way. The Germans are really wonderful. Their, their thought processes. I admire our ancient past. That itself was something fantastic. The next thing I admire is the modern period, Germany. Amazing. Germany has produced some really, really amazing things. Technology, philosophy, talk about everything. It has all been done by the Germans. Of course, they also did genocide. Hitler had the final solution which is put the Jews in the gas chambers and finish them off. Okay, so they have this aberration as well, an aberration that cannot be and should not be forgotten. Uh, so, if you're looking at uh, this whole idea that uh, Habermas has, that Marx is following only one kind of reason, which is instrumental reason. Okay? Uh, because he's thinking like a positivist and 
he believes that only scientificity is reason. He cannot understand that you can have alternative reasons. A great example of alternative reason is Gandhi. So here you have a man who's not a Gaonwala or a Dehati, a villager. He's not that. He's seen the world. He's a barrister educated abroad in England, traveled to South Africa. And what did he do? He saw discrimination. When people asked him to get out of a first class uh, compartment in a train, his argument was that I paid money for it. Why should I get out? They said, you are a person of color, so you have to get out. So they forcibly evict him. And what did that lead to? That one particular act. Because when he went to South Africa, he went to represent a client who had engaged him. I forget the name of that gentleman. He was a Muslim gentleman and I forget his name. He had been hired, Gandhi, by this gentleman to represent him in a court of law. Now when Gandhi saw the injustice of color, he also saw when that happened to him, he also saw that it is happening to others. And first and foremost, what does he do? He sees the plight of Indian low caste workers who were taken to South Africa from India and they were continued to treat as badly as they were treated in India. So Gandhi's process of self-discovery and through that emancipatory reason started there. So, what did he do? He said that if I am a person who truly believes that all human beings are equal, then I must wash the latrines of these low caste workers living in South Africa. I don't know if you know what a latrine is, L-A-T-R-I-N-E. Okay, in India for a long time, people called it a latrine and even in trains, uh, the lavatories were called latrines, but the actual pronunciation is latrine. Okay, and it is not a lavatory. It is not a lavatory. Please don't make me describe that to you now. Look up any, do a Google search. You're the Google generation. So millennials, do a search and find out what a latrine is, how dirty it is. The latrines of the lower caste workers Gandhi said 
I will wash them. And then he asked Kasturba Gandhi, his wife, he asked her, come join with me, let's wash the latrines. And Kasturba Gandhi is taken aback. Kasturba Gandhi is completely taken aback. She says, no, I'm not going to wash any latrines. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to wash. And she wasn't using a cast angle. A latrine is a latrine. What comes out from the body of any caste is the same. She didn't want to wash. But Gandhi gave her an ultimatum. He said, you either leave me or wash the latrine. Those are your choices. If you want to be with me, you have to wash the latrines. If you don't want to wash the latrines, then you can leave me and go back to India. So, she fell in line. And Gandhi, and it was not a one-time token act like uh, what Chandrababu Naidu did with Janma Bhumi. Okay? Where uh, all film stars went with a broom and stood like this and like this, posed, got photographed, dropped the brooms and went home. No, it is not one of those things. And it wasn't a one-time thing. It was something that was done regularly. And it is something that he continued to do after he returned to India in his ashrams at uh, Sabarmati and at uh, Vardha, which is in Maharashtra. So, what is this? An educated man from the upper caste Okay, this man has come. Huh? Very good. That means I'm running out of time. Huh. So, if you therefore look at, if you look at what Gandhi was doing, had nothing to do with his position, had nothing to do with the fact that he was an educated barrister, okay, who had seen quite a bit of England and South Africa. And yet, he felt that compelling need to understand the lower castes. And that compelling need to understand the lower caste made him take up washing of the latrines of the lower castes. So this reasoning for Habermas is not instrumental or technocratic. Elon Musk 
Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, all these people basically represent technocratic reason or instrumental reason. And Marx couldn't see beyond this. That's why he collapsed them into the forces of production is where you have the instrumental reason. Habermas says, in the relations of production, you can have emancipatory, emancipatory reason. That is what is the distinction. Stop here today because I have to sit and do some editing now. You must have seen some superstar, somebody. Hmm? That is the chap with whom I have to sit and do the editing. So I'll stop here. Tomorrow we'll pick up this emancipatory rationality and all that and go on to communicative action and to uh, universal pragmatics where you'll see the influences of American thinkers like John Dewey and uh, especially Richard Rorty, whom Habermas admired a lot, whom he admired a lot. So we'll talk about that and uh, finish that so tomorrow's friday right yeah on saturday morning we will be ready for uh, the life world and uh, we can finish with the life world on saturday and monday go back to aristotle okay that's the way I have planned now and I hope it stays that way. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. And any questions? Uh, I did not get this emancipatory thing, sir. But as you said, you will deal with it tomorrow again. So yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Right. -o. Thank you. So see you folks, thank you for coming. And those of you who have stayed, thank you for staying. And uh, we'll pick this up tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, sir, bye, take care. Bye, thanks. Sir, you do understand that they are saying thank you for letting them go, not for thank you, not as a thank you for sharing knowledge with them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More than anyone else, I understand that. <laughs> After yeah. 20 years of teaching, I guess that must be pretty clear to you by now. Please, it's not 20 years. Oh, it's sorry. 31 30. years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So don't discount my teaching. <laughs> um, okay, then. Right. I'll stop. No. No, you can stop the recording actually because that will that, be an that's, end. To this. Yeah, so I'll have to stop the share and stop. stop the